Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another social emotional workshop. Um, I'm Tony Curitan, your host, and today we are with Harry Ford Health and Lisa Kaplan, and we're so glad to have you back. Today, she's going to be talking about um, the truth about using uh, marijuana. Lisa, take it away. Okay, thank you, Tony. So I work at a substance abuse treatment facility for Henry Ford. It's called Maple Grove Center in West Bloomfield. And so marijuana is a bigger problem today than you can ever imagine. So that's what we're gonna talk about. So as you know, marijuana is a plant. Um, people use the seeds, the stems and the leaves to create um, joints, blunts, which is like a cigar that is cleaned out and filled with with the marijuana. Um, people can use them in vapes, which we're going to be talking about next month. And people can use th them in hookahs and um, through eating it. And we're gonna talk about that a little later. So the THC, the tetrahydrocannabinol, is the active ingredient in marijuana that makes people get high. So we know it commonly is THC. So the THC today is way more powerful than ever before. So when I was a kid, you could not become addicted to marijuana. It simply wasn't strong enough. But today it is intentionally grown stronger so that people can and do become addicted. Now a teen is likely to become addicted because their brains are not fully developed and won't be until the age of 25. So people, teens who use regularly, one in six of them will become addicted. So what happens when a teen uses marijuana regularly before their brain is fully developed is it can impact their brain development. And as a result, there's lower school performance, there's increased school dropout rates, um, and believe it or not, they have tested teens who lose eight to 10 IQ points that are not reversible if they're using marijuana regularly. So it also creates problems with mental health. So depression, anxiety, paranoia, panic attacks, psychosis, meaning being out of touch with reality, schizophrenia, and substance use disorders. So using marijuana can create a future substance use disorder for life. So marijuana is considered to be a gateway drug, just like tobacco and alcohol are. So in other words, using these products opens the gates to other harder drugs. And, you know, think about this. We don't, we don't see people who start with heroin, okay, who start with Vicodin. Usually they start with alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana. So NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, says that marijuana is cancer causing. So we all know that tobacco is cancer causing. Most of us grew up knowing that. But did you know that marijuana is cancer causing? And they say that it's got more cancer causing chemicals than tobacco. So think about it. You're putting a foreign pro product into your lungs. The only things our lungs were meant to handle is oxygen. So it's putting our lungs and our bodies at risk. And have you ever heard of cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome? Okay, CHS. So this is a syndrome that they first recognized when marijuana became legal in Colorado and people were showing up at the emergency room with severe nausea, vomiting, uh, paranoid thinking, panic attacks, um, feeling very sick and dehydrated. And what they determined after doing every expensive invasive test known to man is that there was nothing physically wrong with these people. They determined that the high quantity THC that was being used very frequently was creating these uncomfortable gastrointestinal symptoms. 
So what they determined after seeing it enough times is that there's a syndrome called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And so the gastrointestinal problems are caused by the marijuana, not from a physical complaint. And the only thing to relieve the pain and the discomfort, as silly as this sounds, is either stop using, obviously, or hot showers. I kid you not. People who ha reported having the syndrome reported getting relief from hot showers. So the first time I ever heard of this syndrome was when we had our adolescent program here prior to COVID and a 15 year old girl was in our program. She had severe stomach issues. Her parents took her down to Detroit to Children's Hospital. They did very expensive invasive tests, found nothing wrong. And finally a staff member got her in a room alone and asked her if she's using marijuana regularly. And she said, yes, I am a lot and I can't stop which is how she ended up in our program. So um, be aware that anybody in your life or your students, if they're complaining about stomach problems, consider the possibility and share with parents the possibility that they don't have a gastrointestinal problem at all. It's from regular marijuana use. So also people don't die from marijuana use but they do die from behaviors when they're under the influence. So like, like any other drug, marijuana lowers a person's inhibitions. It affects the way people think. So people take risks that they might not take if they were not under the influence. So it's dangerous. So people crash the car. Um, you know, there's problems with alertness, concentration, coordination reaction time, all of those things. And then also think about anything else, using any type of machinery, okay? Riding a bike, riding a skateboard under the influence, using a knife, okay? Any of those things can be compromised because of the effect of marijuana on the brain. So the issue with our kids, and if you were to ask your students, many of them would tell you that they believe all teens are using marijuana. And this is not true. And the way I know this is because in public schools across the entire state of Michigan, they do confidential anonymous testing of kids, not testing, survey of kids uh, in um, ninth, seventh, ninth and 11th grades. And they ask them about their own personal use and then their friends. And what we have found consistently every time they do these surveys is that the perception of use is higher than actual use. So teens will tell you that everyone is using, absolutely everyone is using. But then when you ask them about their own behavior, and again, it's confidential and anonymous, so there's no reason to lie, they're not using. Okay, so the perception of use is higher than actual use. But the scary thing is because it's legal in Michigan and many other states, the perception of harm is decreasing. So many years ago, before it became legal, students felt it was dangerous. And now, not so much. So the perception of harm is decreasing. So you might have heard of the term edibles. That's when a person uses marijuana, but they don't smoke it they ingest it. So it can be in brownies or cookies, candy. Um, just a few years ago, there was a middle school in Warren, Michigan, where a bunch of kids ingested cereal that was soaked in marijuana oil, and they all ended up at, at the hospital. So people can eat products that have marijuana in them or drink them. It can be in special types of teas. And what happens then is it enters the body in a different way than smoking it. And it takes longer to have an effect, but not everybody knows this. So let's say they eat a brownie and nothing happens. So they have another one and nothing happens. And then they have a third and number one and number two and number three kick in and the person is very, very high. So people need to understand that while edibles take longer for the body to absorb it, 
it's still a, a way to get high. So what we're going to do when I meet with you next month is we're going to talk about vaping or electronic cigarettes and the way that you can use marijuana in those with those products as well. So with that, I'm wondering if there's any questions or comments or discussion about marijuana. You guys, please feel free to unmute and ask your question, or if you like, you can type it in the chat and I will read it out. I'm wondering if you hear about your students using. I know you're not in the school setting, but I wonder if they confide in you. Personally, as an, an educator, I have had students share that they use. Mm -hmm. So is it to decrease stress? What is, what is the reason? To deal with anxiety? No, they never, they, they never expressed a need for it in that capacity. It was always uh, from a recreational perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. Many people do it with the goal of decreasing stress, decreasing anxiety, but here's the problem. Because of the high THC levels these days, it's doing the opposite. It's creating anxiety. It's making present anxiety even worse. So it's not working. Um, okay, so Caitlin heard about it when she was in a physical setting with students. Yeah, um, very common in high schools. I will tell you that here in West Bloomfield, where I work and, and where I live, um, they apprehend students all the time. But what they're doing these days is not using a joint or a blunt or a hookah or anything like that. They're using vapes for marijuana. And of course, in a school setting, if it's marijuana, it is illegal under the age of 21 in Michigan. So those students get involved with the police. If they get caught vaping any type of nicotine product, then they have school issues, but they don't get involved with the police. You guys got any other questions or comments you wanna? I don't know any um, students who smoke marijuana. But I know my sister has stage four cancer and she does use it. So I know, you know, for some people it can help them out. Yeah. Um, Cause she has like, it's in her bones. So she but has like a lot of pain and I know that that helps her out. But I personally don't know any like teens that use it. Well, I hope I don't know any teens that use it. Yeah, so I'm sorry to hear about your sister. Um, it does stimulate appetite. So someone who is very ill, who can't eat, it makes them hungry. So that's a good thing. Um, for many people, it does help with pain. So that's a good thing. But remember, using it recreationally is very different than using it under the supervision of a doctor or to alleviate some really uncomfortable um, side effects of cancer or other illnesses. Um, there was recently a story about a young girl who had multiple seizures all day, every day. And when her parents started giving her marijuana, the seizures decreased. Okay, that's a good thing. Okay, obviously it, it has some very good medicinal purposes. The problem comes in when it's used by teens to get high and their brain is not fully developed. So it's going to impact them for the rest of their lives. So that's where the problem is. Lisa, I have a question. When medical professionals prescribe uh, the use of marijuana for whatever condition that uh, the patient may have, are, what form are they prescribing it in? Edibles, think, oil, smoke, which, which one? I think it's up to the patient to decide what they want. They have so oh. many different options. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I was actually just going to say that uh, my sister, doctor, they just asked her, what, what are you most comfortable with? Um, and, you know, sometimes they have like an oil. Sometimes you can put like under your tongue or something like that. And for, for chemotherapy, you know, you get really um, nauseous and stuff. So that kind of helps with their nausea. Um, but they do give you the option. They, the, the doctor asks her, you know, what, what are you most comfortable with? So, yeah. Okay. Good deal. Yeah. And of course, the more control over it you can give to the patient, the more um, involved in their treatment they become and the more they are able to um, you know, feel like they have some control 
over this disease. It's ironic that you say it can cause nausea and then people use it for nausea if they're um, in chemotherapy. Yeah, so I would guess that if it's making the nausea worse, then obviously they're not gonna use it or they're gonna use marijuana with a lower level THC. So if you go to a dispensary to purchase it, there are a million and one different choices. And the people who work there can guide you to something more mild, okay? Something that isn't gonna make you as nauseous. But the idea with kids, the goal is to get high. The higher, the better. So therefore, with the higher level THC accomplishes that. Someone who's on chemotherapy isn't aiming to get high. They just wanna alleviate their symptoms. You mentioned earlier on that it didn't used to be addictive, but it is now addictive. And, and could you share again, why is that? Because the THC today is intentionally grown to be much, much stronger. Oh. So when I was a kid, it would mellow you out. Some people, some people it had no impact, but it would mellow you out. And that was the goal. But nowadays, the goal is to get high, like really high. And um, what happens with our patients that we have here in our inpatient facility is over time of getting very, very high and getting adjusted to it, their body uh, reg you know, regulates to it, then it's not enough anymore. So now they need something more beyond marijuana. So that's where the problem comes in. The other issue, the other question I get a lot from our patients is, you know, is it okay for me to use it for medicinal purposes when I have a substance use disorder? I'm already addicted to other things. And that's a discussion between them and their doctor. You know, that's not something that, that a social worker could answer. You, you mentioned in um, our last session about secondhand and thirdhand yep. smoke with tobacco. Um, does the same apply with regards to marijuana? Yes. Yes. Although you may not smell it as easily, you know, in a vape, you may not smell it at all, but it's still in the air. The water vapor is in the air. And we'll talk about that more when we meet next month. Okay, you guys, questions, comments? I have a question because <clears throat> my students would come in, I mean, like reeking, reeking, like you almost like a contact high. And um, one of the questions is like with the paper that they roll it with, does that affect? Because then the other piece is they put more, there's more of a quantity. It's not, um, what is that? Um, like when they used to use white papers, now they use brown, I mean, it's, I guess it's not brown paper, but uh, whatever they wrap it in. Yeah, I would say the bigger the wrapper, the more full it is, the higher they're gonna get. So okay. for example, a joint is about the size of a cigarette. Mm -hmm. A blunt is the size of a cigar. Obviously, right. if the cigar is bigger. It's going to hold a higher quantity of marijuana. Here, here's the other thing I didn't mention, which is really, really frightening. Nowadays, the marijuana that you buy it is on the street, not in a dispensary, but on the street, can be laced with fentanyl. And fentanyl is an opioid that is so incredibly powerful that it's killing people. So unless you have a fentanyl test strip, which looks like this, okay, you have no idea if there's fentanyl in it. And most people don't have these. So buying marijuana on the street is not a good idea. But for kids who are under the age of 21, they can't just go to a dispensary. They're not going to sell to a minor. So that's the problem. I have a question. Um... Jerry just mentioned something about a contact high. Is that actually a thing? Can you actually get high from being okay. in the vicinity or the room? So I don't believe so, but I'm not the expert. I will tell you that people who are on probation who test positive 
deny doing it, but they were with friends who did it. So they say they inhaled it from their friends and it was enough to get them high. My understanding is that it's not enough to get you high. So if someone's testing positive, they actually smoked it. However, don't take my word for it. I think that's a better question for a probation officer. So how do they test for it? Are, is it the same as other drugs like urine oh. or? Yeah, good question. So what they do is they do a urine drug screen. And with any other drug, it's either positive or negative. Either you used it or you didn't. But with marijuana, there's a numerical value attached to, to it, a THC level. So the higher the number, the more likely they used. So someone who says, oh, you know, I use once a week, one joint once a week, but their score is 800, something's wrong, right? Um, the only way to be sure a person is not using is if their number is zero or if they used to be a user and they've stopped using, it's gonna take a full 30 days to get out of their system. So it might go from a high number to a lower number to a lower number, and then maybe slightly above zero until it's cleared from their system. So the only way to be certain they're not using it all is, is when they're added zero. Another way besides urine, they take a piece of hair from your head and they test the root going back three months. And they're able to tell if you've used any drugs. Um, so that's another way. Caitlin, you had a question. Yeah, so I'm going to go back to the comment you made about buying um, marijuana on the street versus a dispensary and the increase in fentanyl. Um, my husband works with the narcotics department with the state police and that the fentanyl thing that you mentioned is it's, it's all over. It's it's in everything um, mm -hmm. and quite concerning. So my question is now that, you know, marijuana is legal in the state of Michigan, where are we finding are we still finding that a lot of, you know, young adults, is it more cost effective for them to buy down the street versus a dispensary? Or where are we seeing most of the purchasing taking place now? You mentioned, you, you said a lot of it is um, in vape. So I was wondering if that is specifically from a dispensary, um, just kind of where are we seeing the majority of the purchasing from? Well, you can't purchase from a dispensary unless you're 21. So the, the kids younger than 21 are either having someone purchase it for them or they're buying it off the street, or it's provided to them in a vape, which is typically from a friend or an older sibling. So um, so I don't know specifically the answer to your question, but what I will say is it's pretty scary to think about the fact that they think they're buying marijuana, and this is how teens think. I bought it from my friend. I trust my friend. Well, where did your friend get it? Well, he got it from his friend who got it from his friend, and before you know it, you don't know who these people are, right? So it's really frightening. Same thing, by the way, with any other drug. It's um, fentanyl is in cocaine. It's in Xanax, not the kind you buy get at the pharmacy, but the Xanax you buy on the street. So it's really dangerous. And yeah. the purpose of them putting the fentanyl in it is it to enhance the drug or? Yeah. So two things. It it is a real um big high. So many addicts want that high. The better the high, the better they like it. The other thing is um, fentanyl is very, very inexpensive. And so it expands the supply. So imagine a pile of cocaine, okay, powder cocaine, white powder, it looks like sugar or salt. Okay. Adding fentanyl to it is going to make it look like there's more cocaine. And it's really powerful stuff. So they can sell more product for, for more money. And that's their goal, of course, these drug dealers. And once in a while, someone's going to die. I should say more than once in a while. It's happening a lot. One of the, another question about the various forms that you were speaking about. So um, the gauge of how much is in um, a gummy or something like that. And just like kids would take aspirin or not aspirin, like candy vitamins. Um, is there a measure that's what's in each or it just varies? I mean, I know there's no regulation definitely directly, but if it, to actually 
uh, I don't know. I don't think you'd overdose in with weed. I don't know. But can well, you or what? Okay, so let's say that you are a teen and you're at home and you want to make gummies soaked in marijuana oil. How do you know how much is being absorbed? Okay. Okay, there's no way of knowing that. So when you say you can't overdose, um, I will tell you those kids that I told you about at a middle school in Warren, they all needed to be hospitalized. There, it was too much for their system. So I don't know if you want to call it an overdose or just a negative impact on the body, but they definitely needed medical care. I've never heard of anyone dying of an overdose of marijuana. But again, once you're really, really high, you do behaviors that are risky that could kill you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, then we will bring this session to a close. Thank you so much, Lisa. Excellent presentation as always. Thank you guys for joining and we'll see you all next time. Okay, thank you, Tony. Have a great Bye, day. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you.